Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God that we'd like to consider is our first lesson, Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. We've read that previously. Dear friends, in Christ Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our substitute, our champion, trees can be a source of trouble. In 1976, two United States Army officers, along with some South Korean soldiers, were sent into the demilitarized zone between North Korea and South Korea to cut down a poplar tree that was obstructing the view of the United Nations observers. That contingent went into the demilitarized zone, and as soon as they did, North Korean soldiers came rushing in, brandishing weapons. At the armed confrontation that was there, the South Korean soldiers fled back to South Korea, unaware that they had left behind the two United States Army officers. The North Korean soldiers cruelly murdered them, hacking them to death with the axes the South Korean soldiers had been using. Trees can cause a lot of trouble because that incident almost started another Korean War. Trees can cause a lot of problems. But that's nothing new. All the trouble, all the problems that you've experienced in life, every sickness and disease, every heartache and pain, every frustration and annoyance, is all because of one tree. Ever since Adam and Eve rebelled against God, and ate the fruit of the tree that they were commanded not to eat from. Sin and its effects have plagued mankind. That's a lot of trouble because of one tree. Adam and Eve, when they were created, enjoyed paradise. Everything was perfect. No problems, no trouble. They had a perfect relationship with God, perfect peace with God but they lost it all because of a tree. Again, that's a lot of trouble over one tree. Paradise lost. Look at Adam and Eve's situation when God created them. He didn't give them ten commandments to keep. He gave them only one commandment to keep. We're told in Genesis chapter 2, the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Just one commandment. Don't eat the fruit of the one tree. All the other trees you can eat the fruit from, but not the one tree. One commandment. And look it. That commandment proved too difficult for them to keep. They sinned. They rebelled against a loving God. And they brought trouble into this world. They lost it all. And they had no excuses. They tried the blame game. Adam's excuse was that Eve made him do it. Eve's excuse was that she was deceived by the serpent. And Adam's excuse even had an accusation against God. He said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree and I ate it. In other words, God, it's your fault. You told me it wasn't good for me to be alone, but you were wrong. Look at what that woman you put here with me made me do. What nerve. Try as they made to make excuses. They had no one to blame but themselves for what they did wrong. They rebelled against God and they lost it all. They lost paradise. They were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Unless they try to re-enter, God placed two angels with flaming swords at the entrance to guard and keep them out. But they lost more than paradise. They lost the image of God. They lost the ability to think like God, to talk like God, to act like God. They lost their innocence and gained in its place shame and fear, and foolishness. They lost their love for each other, 
and looked on each other differently than they did before. They lost everything, and all because of a tree. Satan came and deceived them. And you know, Satan's not that creative. He doesn't come up with all kinds of new ways of tempting us, new tactics to use. Why not? Because the sad thing is, we fall for the same old ones over and over and over again. He tempts us in the same way he tempted Adam and Eve. Does God really say, he says, trying to get us to doubt God's word. Does God really say, love your enemies? Look what they did to you. They deserve to have you treat them unkindly. Go ahead, get your revenge. Look what they did to make you miserable. Does God really say that you are to go to worship, to stay close to him? Come on, you can stay close to the Lord all on your own. You don't have to go to worship. Does God really say lust is as bad as adultery? What harm is there in going to those bad websites and looking at pornographic pictures? Go ahead and do it. And then there's the lie. The Lord isn't looking out for you. He doesn't want you to have a blessed life. Look at The Lord knows that you would be very, 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 very happy and better off if you lived selfish and self-centered lives. But he doesn't want that for you. He wants to hold you back. He wants you to have a boring life. So go ahead. Live it up. Live for yourself. Forget about God. That's his temptations. And before we blame Adam and Eve for ruining everything for us, we need to take a look at our own lives. Remember, Adam and Eve had no real reason to be suspicious When that serpent came in and talked to them, when Satan used that serpent to tempt them. Prior to this event, there was no such thing as a lie. Adam and Eve may have been naive, but there was no such thing as a lie. We're different. We've been warned about Satan, that he's the roaring lion looking to devour us. We know the tactics he uses. We see it here. We see it with Jesus. And yet, what do we do? Again and again and again and again, we fall to those temptations of Satan. And make all the excuses you want. It's not my fault. If my spouse were nicer, I wouldn't be as rude. It's not my fault. If my children were more obedient, I would have more patience. It's not my fault. If my boss were more fair, I'd work harder. But you know, as well as I know, that we can't make excuses for our rebellion against God. We're to blame. It's not Adam and Eve's fault that you sin. It's not Satan's fault that you sin. And it's certainly not God's fault that you sin. It's your fault that you sin. And it's my fault that I sin. And because of our rebellion against God, doing those things that he's forbidden us to do, we lose. We lose out on happy homes. We lose out on peace in our lives. We lose out on clear consciences. We lose out on the image of God. And because of that, we deserve the curse of the snake to crawl on our bellies all our days and eat the dust, until we return to the dust of death. We deserve to lose out on paradise forever, to be separated from God in hell forever and ever. That's what we deserve. And yet, look at our God. Look at how our God operates. Look at verse 15 of our text. Here the Lord says to Satan, and I will put enmity, that is hatred, between you, Satan, and between the woman, Eve, and between your offspring, the unbelievers, and hers, the believers. 
He, that's an individual, one of Eve's offspring, will crush your head, and you, Satan, will strike his heel. In that fight against Satan's temptations, Adam and Eve lost. But another would come to resume that fight in their place. Enter the substitute, the offspring of Eve, Jesus. Now in the conflict between the substitute and Satan, Satan struck the first blow. We heard about that in our gospel reading for today. Satan went and tempted Jesus there in the wilderness after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, trying to get him to rebel against God as he had gotten Adam and Eve to do. And look at his same old tactics. Can you really trust God's word where he says he will provide for you? Look at you're hungry. You haven't eaten for 40 days. Turn those stones into bread. Or, God doesn't really love you. Test his love. Jump off this highest point of the temple. Test his love. Or, God doesn't really want good for you. He wants to take all the fun out of your life. Bow down and worship me and I'll give you everything. But look, Jesus struck back. He resisted every temptation of the devil and lived a completely perfect life. He had no need to make excuses because he always obeyed his heavenly Father. Well, then Satan struck a vicious blow on Good Friday, manipulating Judas and Caiaphas, Herod and Pilate. He succeeded in killing his adversary, Jesus. He succeeded in having the very Son of God beaten, mocked, scourged, crucified, covered with nothing but shame, the shame of your sin and my sin and the sin of the world. Satan struck Jesus' heel, and it looked like he had won. But this offspring of Eve struck back. And by his very death on the cross, he undid Satan's foul work in the Garden of Eden. By his very death on the cross, He won the victory over Satan. And as he rose from the dead, he crushed the serpent's head. He showed his total domination over all that Satan had worked so hard for. By the empty tomb, he proved his total victory. And by Jesus' work, Adam and Eve again lost. They lost it all, their sin. They lost it all because of a tree, because of Jesus' cross. Their rebellion against God's one commandment, all gone. Their excuses for their open rebellion against God, all gone. The way they looked at each other naked, trying to see how they could use, not love one another, all gone. They lost it all because of a tree. Paul wrote in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. All their sin taken away because Jesus died on that tree. And yet, the results of their sin would still be in effect. Thorns and thistles, sweat and pain, troubled relationships, And ultimately, death would all be part of their life because of their rebellion against God. But peace with God would endure. By clinging to the promise of the Savior who was to come, paradise would be restored to them. Some 900 years later, when their bodies returned to the dust from which they came, and their souls went to the paradise of heaven and all because of a tree. And it's no different for us. This offspring of Eve came into this world to serve not just as a substitute for Adam and Eve, but for you and for me too. He withstood Satan's attacks for you. He lived a perfect life for you. He died on the tree for you. And now you know what's happened to your sin. 
because of the way in which he crushed Satan's head. Your sins are all gone. Your rebellion against God's Ten Commandments, all gone. The excuses you made for your open rebellion against God, all gone. The way you try to use and manipulate other people, all gone. All your sins, all gone. Because of a tree, the cross of Jesus, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curses everyone who is hung on a tree. And yet for us, the consequences of our rebellion against God still remain. Thorns and thistles, sweat and pain, troubled relationships, and death are ultimately there for us. But as we cling in faith to the Savior who's promised to return, we know that peace with God endures. And we know that one day paradise will be restored for us too. When our bodies return to the dust from which they came, our souls will be taken to the glory of paradise above the paradise of heaven. And so, as you consider all of that, look to your Lord and Savior always. Hold to him. Stop making excuses for your sins. There are no excuses. Turn to the Lord for forgiveness and strive with your whole being to serve him, the one who gave you everything that really matters, peace right now with God and life eternal in heaven. Serve him with your all because he's given you everything. All because of a tree. Amen.